Good, good afternoon. I almost said good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Zabilet. I am the secretary for the entertainment section for the Beverly Hills Bar. I want to welcome you to our uh, webinar on advising film and TV clients about COVID-19 legal issues. I think you'll find this to be a great panel. We've got some really awesome panelists with us today. I'm going to do a short introduction and uh, of each person, and then we're just going to roll right into the uh, we do have a Q&A button up on the, on the screen, and you can also, that's where you should be asking questions. You may also see chat. Uh, I will be checking those from time to time, and uh, we will be answering questions after each person's presentation for a few minutes. And if we have time, we may do some Q&A at the end as well. Uh, one plug for the entertainment section, we do have a meeting just like this, but not a webinar. Every first Wednesday of the month, at 8.30 in the morning. Um, they used to be held at the BHBA, now they're held at Zoom, at your own home, which is awesome because you have great food and, and coffee at the ready. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let me introduce our panelists. First, uh, I'd like to introduce Winnie Wong. She's the Senior Vice President of Film, Television, and New Media at Momentus Insurance. Uh, and Winnie's been around for a while. I'm not yep. gonna get into all of her bio. <laughs> I have been around. That at your, at your leisure. Um, <laughs> she probably wouldn't want me to read it either. No. So uh, <laughs> next up is uh, Peter Graham. Uh, say hi, Peter. Hello. Um, and so Peter is, uh, he, he, again, we have these, we're all veterans of this. So he was at uh, Lewis Horowitz. Uh, he's doing some other stuff now, but he's done a lot of independent film financing work. So he's going to be uh, talking today about film financing. Uh, next up with uh, Larry Burbitt. Larry is the vice chair of the entertainment section, so next year he'll be the chair. And, uh, and Larry has been around for a long, long time as well, including stints and in studios as an independent attorney, which he is now. And uh, he's done all kinds of uh, awesome deals that you can also read about. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, uh, running the show today, as far as the pan as the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, is uh, David Albert Pierce, managing partner of the Pierce Law Group, uh, which does both transactional and litigation work uh, in the entertainment industry, and they're located in the wonderful city of Beverly Hills, out there in Wilshire and Doheny, where there's nowhere to go eat. So, I'm sure they're happy at home. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to kick this off with uh, Winnie talking about insurance issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us today, and I appreciate the time. I, obviously, this is an exciting type topic right now. Um, I'm an entertainment insurance broker, and I've been doing this for some time. Like <laughs> Greg was saying, I've been around 25 plus years. Um, <clears throat> I am the middleman that works with both the insurance company and the filmmaker to find the most competitive and comprehensive production policies. What production policies do is um, cover a filmmaker from the beginning to the end of the project. So the normal policies that are applicable are general liability, auto, workers' comp, and production package. These policies cover various claims as well, so bodily injury, property damage, as well as um, <clears throat> cast injury and particular things like um, damage to props and equipment. So these injuries and or any of these types of claims are really covered with the intention to get the production company through the production and finished at the end of the policy. So the intent of production insurance is to get the producer whole again and finished by the end of the production. So anyway, um, currently the entertainment industry has been you know, impacted by COVID-19. We've been reporting a number of claims and been working with a lot of adjusters, which is a lot of fun. Um, our objective is to find a way to reimburse the production company for their talent, crew, and um, location expenses. The most common claim that we've been seeing is civil authority. This is coverage under the production package. Um, in this situation, the governor, who is a civil authority, uh, instructed shelter at home, which prevented production companies from filming. 
this is definitely a black and white world where this would be covered. And we would explain it to the um, insurance companies and file a claim. Mm -hmm. So far, we've been lucky. A couple of the production companies have already been paid. Uh, one is particularly about a million dollars right now. Um, eminent peril is another type of claim which is included under the production package. In, in this situation, the production company may halt the production because of a eminent peril. This would be an example of this would be if the production company has a crew member that has COVID-19, they would want to stop because they don't want to infect any other crew members. Now, the last item here is another claim, which is business interruption. Many companies, companies have attempted to get reimbursement under the property policies because they're unable to work. And unfortunately, the outcome here is insurers are coming back saying, COVID-19 is not a physical damage situation. COVID-19 does not cause, you know, the building to be, you know, something to be damaged. So here, they're defining it, and they're saying that this would not be covered because it's a physical damage claim that must be reported. So civil authority and, and uh, eminent peril are the, probably the only two items that we've been finding success on. Um, part of the process here is that insurers' positions are unfortunately going to deny coverage on occasion. So these are the reasons why a production insurance you know, broker needs to be involved because we need to fight with the adjusters mm -hmm. and try to find a, a, a way to get some type of expenses reimbursed. Now, of course, if declinations happen, that's not a good thing because companies are filing lawsuits against the insurers. So the first item, as you see, French Laundry Partners is an example. They're the first ones to file a claim by suing their insurer, Hartford. They're saying that the defense basically is that COVID-19 contaminants on surfaces is physical damage. We'll see if that works. Um, in addition, there's another one down here, Oceana, Oceana Grill. That is also a lawsuit against Lloyds of London. So these kind of claims are occurring and there will probably be more than where you know, insurance companies might be sued. There are uh, also issues primarily with regards to the insurance um, bureau here in California, they're indicating that they are going to um, go after some of these insurance carriers that are not providing yeah, fair settlements for some of these claims. So this just got reported today from the Department of Insurance in California. Okay, David, I guess the next slide is in order. Okay. And then insurance, this is not my forte, but I do have answers with regards to this. Production has, you know, has influences on event coverage. Business interruption insurance for venue owners is again, the same kind of trying issue where this is not physical damage. COVID did not provide any um, damages to the location. So that unfortunately would not be covered. Oops. Under the general liability, there is a provision for physical damages to property. Normally, that is if the client, you know, makes takes, you know, makes an an issue where they're, let's say, damaging the location. That would be covered under the liability. <clears throat> anyway, in this situation, what does happen is we do have rented premises under the policy, which would be covered in the case of your rental of the location has to be moved to another location, you probably can get extra expenses paid for the rental of the new location. Um, cancellation insurance policies and non-appearance policies are definitely policies that could respond to some of the venues issues. But right now, most of these policies are manuscripted and the insurance carriers are saying that they have to review each claim case by case. Okay, David, thanks. Moving forward, the producers are going to expect some big problems because the insurance rates are gonna go up due to the fact that there are a lot of losses that have been filed under every single situation. The insurance carriers are you know, increasing their rates, which would mean that the premiums will go up. In addition, the deductibles may be increased as well. And um, the issues that are gonna take place are 
two, twofold. One, automatically there will be a COVID-19 exclusion. The second part of it is that the insurance companies are going to need to review every single production to make sure that they're covering um, the right things and they want to know if there is <clears throat> what you're going to do to prevent the spread of COVID. So most of these situations right now is a learning process because we have not really gotten into productions yet. There are some smaller production companies that are able to get into commercials, doing some interviews for documentaries. So those have been easier because they're only one-on-one -on -one and only a camera. So those can be covered in most cases. The smaller productions will have less risk because there's less people and they would need, of course, the same situation, reviewing how you're going to keep everybody safe. Um, with regards to the bond companies, I have talked to a couple and right now they're saying they're waiting for the guild associations to come up with you know, standards and some type of um, ruling such as SAG and um, after those are the ones that are probably going to impact the bond companies. So at this present time, it's still a status of questions or the ability to come up with, you know, sending a claim in just to report it and seeing where it goes is kind of what is happening right now. So insurance, the risk is right now difficult, but eventually as the vaccination comes out, things will be improving and obviously less risk means removing exclusions and et cetera. So this is where we at right now. Okay. Before Greg opens it up to the questions, I see we have at least one or two. Uh, I, I want to just ask you, Winnie, uh, we yeah. were talking yesterday about, uh, in, in addition to business interruption insurance, that there was uh, yeah. government, what, what did you call that? The go government order or government? Oh, civil, authority. Authority. That's civil authority. And I did civil talk authority. about that. Yeah, civil authority who's preventing you from actually working. So the stay at home or shelter at home, um, you know, in mandate has caused a lot of claims where a lot of the production companies couldn't get permits, can't work, locations are not available. So these are claims under civil authority. And that exists in most basic general liability policies okay. or production packages? Always in the production package. That's where it is. So but we're going to we're going to start seeing moving forward that the, that, that this might be an exception right. to the civil authority rule unless they pay extra. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Sometimes the carriers may remove, and it, right now there is a carrier that's removing civil authority and eminent peril because of the claims that they're getting. But there are other carriers who have been around longer who are willing to, of course, provide it for a lower limit. Uh, Winnie, uh, we do have a couple of questions. Okay, uh, sure. <laughs> one is, uh, uh, do production policies normally include virus, virus exclusions? Yeah, unfortunately, in this case, well, in the production package case, we're lucky because that that particular policy does not have COVID right now. Going forward, there will be a COVID exclusion. But presently, the issue is, you know, there is the civil authority, there is eminent peril, and those two lines will respond to this kind of claim as long as, of course, those policies don't have COVID. But going forward, COVID-19 is going to be excluded on all policies. Do you know about uh, uh, how much losses have been claimed at this point or, um, or what impact those will have on premiums? Well, that's that's the thing. The, the claims have been in the millions. I don't know the exact amount, but obviously that impact, of course, will bring up the premiums. And that is definitely, unfortunately, the situation for production insurance and other carriers as well are going to do that for all different lines. So but, that's it. Yeah. That's, but, but, that, but premiums are, are based on experience ratings, right? So, um, so there's yes, no but, way to predict? Yeah, there's no way to predict. We will work on it. Of course, we massage the premiums and work with the insurance companies to see if maybe the experience level might reduce the pricing. But overall, right now, you know, I've been told that in the next two years, rates are going to go up and there are going to be conditions under the policy with higher deductibles and maybe lower limits as well. So that's it for now. Um, and then the, a common question that I'm seeing, not only, you know, with re regards to productions, but everywhere now, mm -hmm. you've got uh, uh, 
people trying to get back to work, uh, right? The the film might want to be, the studio might want to film, but the actor <coughs> or director or whoever doesn't want to come out there because they're afraid of safety. Is that a is that something that would be covered under a COVID plan or non-COVID plan, or are they just out of luck? Yeah, unfortunately, that is not something that we can cover at this point. Productions, first off, have to get a course greenlit, and if the cast member can't participate, that is not unfortunately an insurance risk um, that would have to be worked out by the producers and the production company. And and potentially unemployment comp and yes. whatever. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we got a, a UK question. I got uh, a UK? Wow. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> they have a government closure order, uh, which, you know, obviously you might see here too, something similar that says you have to, uh, uh, be closed except to comply with legal obligations. So is that open up a door because maybe uh, we can quantify a quote unquote legal obligation as a contract to give an insurer an, a, a way out from coverage? Well, that's a good question. And, and ordinarily with regards to production, the only issue here is, you know, of course, contracts between production company as well as vendors and all cast members. But at this point, I don't see anything that's going to change. Although if the government here in the United States covered, let's say COVID-19, that would be covered and responded to very easily, but that's not happened. Um, okay. So right now in the U S we have nothing that's uh, standardized yet. What happens if the banks don't accept the exception to the uh, policy and completion bond? And yeah, that might a be good a good problem. question for the banker. Yeah, that's a banker question. So, okay, we'll, we'll that save that for the banker. Okay. So he knows he he knows he's got that one. That one. Write that one down. <laughs> we'll come okay. back to that. Uh, are there other policies besides uh, E and O or A D and D that uh, that might apply, or doesn't it matter because there's going to be COVID exclusions or similar exclusions going forward? Well, I don't think the errors and emissions world is subject to it because really the errors and emissions in, is intended to cover the you know the project to distribution. So usually it's clearance and copyright issues under that policy. So there may not be exclusions under there. And unfortunately that does not help. The acquisition development policy is for acquiring rights and developing a project. So that has nothing to do with COVID. And the producer's ENO is for, you know, releasing a production to a distributor. So all of those conditions are not, it has nothing to do with unfortunately COVID-19. All right. Well, I think we should, uh, you know, stay on track here and and uh, move on to uh, Peter. You're yeah. up. I'm up. Okay. Thank you for having me, David. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, film financing. Um, obviously, this is a totally new world that no one has experienced uh, when you have a wholesale shutdown of the world. Um, the good news is, uh, I think it's proven the fact that uh, entertainment is countercyclical. When when you look at the demand, because everybody's sitting at home, it's gotten went through the roof. Uh, if you look at Netflix stock, I think it's gone up 50% since uh, the shutdown started. And um, if you have product, people are going to want to watch it. So I think to answer the question, how is it going to affect the banking world as a whole? I think given that there will be a demand, it's going to be a lot easier to get film production done than, say, financing an airline company where demand has dropped 90%. Um, as far as the banking world has been affected, we actually had a, um, a group call with a, a bunch of the financiers to see what's going on. And um, for the most part, I think the current situation for existing transactions, people are okay with it. Um, if it's gotten into post, um, you know, you're pretty much home free because you don't have to worry about so much exposure as everybody's doing stuff remotely. And uh, the completion bonds, to the best of my knowledge, uh, did not have COVID experience, um, exclusion. And so those from a banker's point of view said, okay, if it doesn't get fixed, I'm at least covered for the insurance. Um, we actually are actively trying to uh, buy uh, anybody's portfolio who wanted to get out of this space. Um, some people had liquidity issues and uh, we're backed uh, by a large family office. And so we've been actually um, hunting for new deals. Uh, the other short term type of prospect is you that see people who ran out of money. Uh, and again, we are looking at transactions where they're in post, they need finishing money uh, or uh, and again, we're focusing kind of on live action. 
you have to look at the impact on something like animation. And animation is, um, well, you know, could have some issues with uh, maybe the, the voice getting, uh, the lead actor on a voice getting sick. Um, you don't have the massive exposure of people. So, uh, in fact, right now we're looking at the three animations uh, that we hope to get going, and we're not as overly concerned with the COVID-19. Um, kind of answer the, the question that uh, Winnie had punted on, will banks take COVID-19 risk? And I think the short answer is no. Um, you know, as a lender, you've got to look that we don't have a huge margin um, to take a risk that you completely lose your entire uh, loan on one particular transaction. Um, I think what's going to happen to either A, that if the, uh, if the insurers can't cover that risk, um, this unique COVID virus, uh, COVID-19 risk is not just unique to the entertainment industry. Um, I think we may have to look to the government as sort of last resort to cover type of COVID-19 because that impacts every uh, business. Um, short of that, and people are still trying to figure out what to do, I think, um, possible changes in how, as a lender, uh, approaches the business would be that, well, if you actually look at the COVID risk, and I'm sure the the guilds are going to come up with practice, standards and practice of how to keep people on set, quarantine people, and, uh, you know, that will probably mitigate some, but you still have that risk. I think from a lender's point of view, one thing you might look at is that, you know, your real COVID risk is not the entire nine-month production cycle. It's really maybe that four weeks during production. So maybe you'll fund, you know, after principal photography has been completed. And, and most of you involved in independent finance know the bond kind of closes just about then anyway. So I think to a certain degree, if there is an exclusion, um, the lenders uh, like ourselves will try to figure out how to not have that exposure or at least, or at least minimize it so you're not uh, overly concerned with uh, that particular risk. Uh, one of the things, as you know, in financing that people run around the world to look for uh, specific uh, subsidies. I think uh, in at least the short term, looking to where the shoot won't just be on subsidies, we may favor places that had incredibly low uh, COVID. Um, for instance, Australia, I think had like 7,000 cases. New Zealand had 1,500 cases. Uh, they have tax incentive. Um, one could feel fairly safe uh, going down there. Uh, they're both islands. All right, technically Austria is not an island. Um, but uh, I think those type of considerations can help somewhat offset the um, risk of a COVID-19. And, and, and one of the things, much like the insurers, uh, bankers like to handicap risk. And so, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but uh, you try to at least, if something goes wrong, that you can uh, survive that particular um, issue. Um, when it goes back to um, what can we expect from lenders, um, well, from us, you know, to be flexible and figure out how to do it. Um, I think the banks will be a little more in, you know, you have the private lenders in the banks. I think the banks will be a little more hesitant. Um, because they're very, very risk averse and they have to go through kind of bureaucracies uh, to deal with change. Um, interestingly enough, back in 2008 in the last financial crisis, uh, that was one of our best years because a lot of the banks have pulled back and we sat down and looked at, um, you know, a deal is a good deal and you can make it even if there is a crisis going on. Um, to answer what will lenders expect from producers, uh, well, you know, they've got a tough job. I think at the end of the day, everybody's going to have to work together. Uh, and it's not just what they have to do, is how we can help them. And as I mentioned before, we may say, look, why don't you shoot down where there's a low uh, COVID incident? And uh, there'll be other changes where maybe you'll have to keep the crew completely isolated during the production cycle. Uh, that will add additional costs just as the premiums will go up. And um, hopefully the market, uh, the end user in the distribution side will absorb those costs because, you know, people still want to see movies. People still want to see TV, uh, even after this short term um, kind of uh, stay at home orders are going to be eased. Um, it's not going to be back business as normal uh, in that respect. Uh, one of the things that we do look at, though, in distribution in this particular crisis, what we have found is on the um, one of the distribution the risks that we look at is do people pay? And surprisingly enough, that the buyers around the world 
have been paying for their films. Uh, if you have a film com completed, they want to buy it because they have kind of that demand for it. The only issue actually that we've really seen uh, on payment is uh, the airlines, um, which, you know, it's not a small number. Uh, they're not paying uh, for any type of films at this point. But uh, by and large, it's kind of business as usual as far as um, once you get the film made. So I think the real challenge is, is, is getting it through that production cycle. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'm sure the guilds will come up with standards and procedures and hopefully either um, you know, Lloyd's and London will cover some type of COVID-19 risk or again, from a lender's point of view, you would uh, fund the production where the risk is uh, de minimis. Uh, one thing that obviously there is a concern with uh, subsidies, you know, if you look at the Gavin Newsom talking about we have a massive deficit here in California and are they going to start cutting the film credits or make changes in what you can use, um, but I don't think they will not not pay them. I think that'll just um, reduce the availability of, of subsidies and, and by and large we focus at 120db on the independent side and so the independents didn't get a whole lot from california and there are other states that uh, people can go to um look at the slide there's going to be a changing on the oscars um i still haven't gotten invited to the oscars so to be quite frank i'm not uh, the first to uh comment on that but um will virtual symbol save art houses um you know i think that People still will want to go out. Uh, I think, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of all my Zoom meetings and people like to socially interact. Um, so I believe that, you know, online streaming is uh, here to stay, but once it opens up, people are going to want to go uh, back out to the cinema. Um, the comment that uh, Trolls made 100 million worldwide, I think that's a combination of no one can go out and you want your kids to watch anything. And so I'm sure they probably, it's probably only five kids watched it 50 million times, but um, <laughs> that uh, I think there's a little bit of a nominee because that's for, again, targeted towards children. And um, you are going to see the theaters open up. There was just an announcement today that um, Disney's going to open up Mulan in July and the Chris Lowland's um, tenant is going to open it up. And they're hoping that, you know, you just have every, every other seat for people to enjoy uh, the movie. Um, they'll be able to go that way um, again. But that's, uh, I, I don't think movie going will disappear, um, but obviously it's going to be somewhat um, reduced. And you can see that tension between, you know, the open uh, warfare between uh, Universal and AMC, where they're, you know, they recognize that they had this huge success um, just from a pure monetary view without having to go to the theaters. But at the end of the day, um, you know, going to the movies is, is part of our cultural experience. Uh, don't believe you can get an Oscar nomination unless it's theatrically re re uh, re released. And, and more importantly, I think the box office is the one place where we get some type of uh, transparency on the success or failure of a movie. Uh, and that type of uh, information goes to everybody, including the actors uh, and uh, you know, trying to figure out whether something worked or not, because no one knows if, let's say, a Netflix show is successful because they don't share their data. Greg, do you want to go to questions? It looks like we have at least one there. Well, we have a whole bunch of questions, um, Peter. So, uh, yes, uh, we can certainly roll with questions. Let me just kind of... Uh, so what kind of exclusions are we looking at here, like act of God, force majeure? Uh, you know, that's, that's uh, obviously something, um, other types of exclusions that, that might squiggle in there to kind of, uh, prevent somebody from paying out on a, on a bond or prevent financing. And then obviously, uh, when do you have a postponement versus an actual cancellation? Because, uh, you know, there's a possibility maybe that they could return to filming, filming. Uh, what what defines a, a cancellation outright if you've got something that started and now you've got money that's been expended but it's not going forward and Greg I am gonna my section talk about force majeure and the doctrine of impracticability and frustration of purpose but if the banker has thoughts well, on I, I, you know classic um, legal answer it depends um, <laughs> when the, the situation actually occurred if you're 
you know, just the classic was um, we were involved in a film where uh, the actor um, got hurt and they had to shut it down for six months. And it was a personal, you know, essential element insurance. And it was paid, it was a $6 million claim on that. But they went ahead and made the movie after the actor, um, actor had healed. And then you have the other where someone completely dies and you can't replace them. I think it was um, uh, Jim Candy or something. Um, and that's a complete abandonment. Um, I think at the end of the day, people want to get something completed. Um, and there are a lot of creative ways, special you see now where they can make a digital actor, let's say to finish it up or cut the scenes or whatever. So I think at the end of the day, people want to have the project. And, you know, like I said, it depends on the, the actual when it happens and, and if it can be fixed or not. So uh, one of the, the news stories I saw the other day was uh, how, because other states are opening up, other states are going to attract filming such as Georgia versus California, which uh, brings to mind that a lot of states have state film funds and, uh, you know, film credits, things like that. Uh, how are, how does this, uh, do you know how this is impacting any of those kinds of payments or incentives? Well, well, what we're going to see is, and we're already seeing that just the whole process is going to be slowed down to, you know, if, the government is shut down. They're not going to be processing the payments. They're going to have a black backlog. And also the governments are going to be hurting financially. They've taken huge hits. I mean, California, which, you know, had a rainy day fund is already spending that. Uh, New York New York is going to be massively uh, underfunded. Um, and they may have to cut back um, simply because out of necessity. But they haven't. And, and New York State has changed the rules in the past, uh, even though, uh, for instance, in the middle of the game, they said, well, if you have a credit over a million dollars, you have to pay it over two years. And if you were a financier thinking you can get paid in one and now you have two, you know, that's just a risk you didn't anticipate. But by and large, we believe they, you know, ultimately you should get paid. It's more a matter of timing. But I think that the bigger issue is that, uh, great, uh, Georgia has a credit and I believe they uh, started off early by opening up tattoo parlors and massage parlors and um, barber shops, even though they had COVID riding. Great, you have a wonderful tax credit, but what actor is going to go down to a place that they could probably get sick? And I think that's one of the challenges we're going to have is to see that, okay, you've got them, then I don't want to go to a place that still has a high level of, 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 of cases, uh, which is why I mentioned earlier that, you know, I can see people going, let's go to Fiji. You know, there's only 18, seriously, there's 18 cases of COVID down there, and they have a tax incentive. And well, what a better place to go than an island that's uh, relatively free. Uh, do you find anybody trying to use COVID-19 to get out of a, say, like a pre-sale contract? Oh, so of course. Of course. But that's, <laughs> that's uh, common in, 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 the, in the independent world. I, I remember back in the day, a uh, Brazilian client didn't want to pay uh, because of 9-11. And we're like, but you weren't impacted by 9-11. So it, it's, it's a me too. Um, yeah. We just got that. Some of it is legitimate. We did have a, a, a Spanish buyer say, hey, look, I can't pay from COVID-19. And it turns out the reason they can't pay is that they were selling to the TV stations and TV stations are saying they're not going to pay because of COVID-19. So in some cases, there is some uh, legitimacy to that, uh, those statements. But we recently just got, I'm surprised, we just got paid uh, from Russia. You know, and that's usually a, a, a tough uh, place to get your money back from. But as I said earlier, the, the airlines are the ones that you're just like, well, give up. You're not going to get any funds from them. So films generally, uh, the, the film is, is in its, you know, ability to be shown theatrically uh, and, and generate revenue that way. Obviously that's kind of changing a little bit with Netflix and other streamings. Uh, but another, another way there was some value was uh, via uh, film festivals, right? So there was always get the buzz because you got bought out at can or a con or however you say it. Uh, how are these cancellations of these festivals and non just non, you know, theatrical uh, performance? How, how is that impacting film values? I, I think, you know, those events are all about creating awareness and 
that's the the essence of it but it's not just that there's a certain excitement there's a certain prestige there's a certain filter that if you get nominated to can even though the movie may not be that good you said hey i'm at this this particular festival or venice or toronto and i think that uh, there was a, an article about that is how we're going to in the new york times about how we're going to why is are these festivals so important it's not just necessarily for the film promoting the particular film it's promoting the industry you know, and, you know, we all run out to the south of France or even the Berlin in the wintertime so we can see everybody from L.A., but it's really more to create the awareness, establish the bonds, both on the business and creative side. And again, as you had mentioned, you know, I think it was Parasite uh, first got noticed uh, at the Cannes Film Festival. And so those things are important. But at the other end, you know, I hate to say it, some of us here are a little bit older than most. Uh, that's mostly Dave and I. Um, a lot of kids now, you know, they're getting their stuff from, you know, Twitter, TikTok, TikTok um, Instagram. And so I think the challenge would be, can you uh, pivot to get to a wider audience than kind of the relatively narrow people who follow film festivals? So you think that the, that may kind of make uh, the AMC Universal spat a little bit... Uh uh two two big shots arguing over something that many other people are met well i think i think that's accelerated an argument before where they wanted to kind of squeeze the windows um mm -hmm. again when you look at the bulk of the the revenues where they're getting you know everything's going streaming and, and this is why um they're making their own platforms themselves you know they're, they don't really need to go through uh, to get to a wide audience just to have a theatrical release, but there's still that certain magic, that certain bragging rights that may kind of overshadow the uh, true economic value of releasing theatrically. But um, one thing that you'll still find is not just in the U.S., I think in foreign, when people look at the value of the film, they want to know what the theatrical release is. And that, you know, literally you could have the same film that went straight to SVOD or one that got theatrical release and they'll pay three times as much for a theatrical release than they did for an SVOD release. And, and that's primarily because the studios have spent so much money on promoting it and the promotion goes beyond uh, the local area of the United States. Right, right, great. Uh, do you want to move on to, because keep this on track, let's uh, move on to Larry. We've got there. Unmute gotta, yourself gotta, there, Larry. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. I have to hey, sign thank off. And... You. Thanks, Greg. Uh, first, I want to thank Peter. Dave. Oh, you went. You got muted again there, Larry. How about now? Perfect. There we go. Okay. I want to thank David uh, first for putting together the PowerPoint for everybody. Uh, when we're talking about uh, startup production, we're really talking about a moving target, not only as to when, but as to how. Uh, as we move forward in the coming months, we will all be privy to multiple advisories and guidelines to be suggested by various federal, state, and local agencies, along with those by the industry organizations, including the guilds, the long-established industry-wide labor management safety committee, and those from major studios and networks. Nothing is in cement. Nothing will be in cement. Uh, but what I'll try to address here are, are many of the actions currently being considered in efforts to protect personnel, the PRODCOs, studios, and the networks. Let me first say that uh, I don't profess to present any definitive answers here. Uh, if you're like me as a production council, you'll consult with many experts in their various respective specialties. You know, talk to people like Winnie, talk to, you know, specialized labor council. Uh, and others on the front line so you can gather the best information from the best sources. Uh, the materials uh, in the PowerPoint have lots of numerous links to articles and protocols that it, I, I'm sure you'll find helpful. And as we move forward, there'll be more published, there'll be more going on, and uh, it may be somewhat confusing because you know, the goal in my mind would be for all the networks and all the studios and all the guilds to come up with one protocol because it'll be very confusing if you're a production company and you have to follow the Lionsgate protocol and you have to follow the Disney protocol or you have to follow, you know, someone else's protocol 
and you're working on two, three, four different productions. Uh, so hopefully, you know, everybody will get together. And by the time we get back into production, you know, we can, you know, all agree on, on one methodology uh, and set of protocols to follow. Um, one of the first questions my clients asked me well over a month ago, well, and I'm going to ask David to move on to the uh, next uh, slide, the workers' comp slide. Uh, one, you know, one of, the, one of the first questions they said was, we come back to work, somebody gets COVID, am I going to be liable? And until May 6th, uh, you know, in my consultations with Labor Council, Workers' Comp Council, uh, you wouldn't be liable because COVID was considered just like the cold and the flu. Um, and unless there were specific increased type of risks in the workplace where they could argue it sufficiently, uh, workers' comp wouldn't cover it. And the goal would be that you will still wouldn't be liable under general theories. Uh, however, it doesn't mean somebody won't sue you. But on May 6th, Governor Newsom signed an executive order, N6220, which extended workers' comp to employees in the workplace who contract COVID-19. Now, you, you know, the slide will cover this, and I think we'll take a look at the slide for a minute, because it's a rebuttable presumption. The presumption is that the employee will be eligible for workers' comp, not if they're working from home, you know, or if they're coming in voluntarily, and there are certain dates that it covers, it goes retroactive to March 19th when the governor's stay at home order went into effect, and right now it runs through July 5th. Uh, who knows if it's gonna be extended? Uh, and, an, uh, you know, it's a, it's a temporary disability, and you have to meet certain, you know, testing, and, you know, did you get sick, and a lot of various things. There's a link to the work order in the materials uh, or to the executive order. And, and I suggest you take a look at it and familiarize yourself with it uh, to go over with your clients. So if someone does come down with it, uh, they're aware of, you know, they'll contact the workers' comp people and then they'll have to go through whether it is indeed covered. Uh, one, one, uh, next next uh, slide, David, please. Uh, one of the other things that uh, to consider here are all the uh, questions regarding basic compliance uh, with a lot of factors. And, you know, to go back a second to the workers' comp issue, uh, one of the things to consider is uh, the common practice by production companies, which despite AB5 and a lot of uh, our are admonitions to clients uh, that they should not be hiring people as independent contractors under AB5. You know, the question is whether this workers' comp provision would apply to these independent contractors. Uh, previously, before AB5, you know, someone that was a loan out, they had, we had language in contracts regarding general and special employees, which uh, would put them under workers' comp coverage. Uh, but if it's determined today uh, that the Prodco employed someone through a loan out in violation of AB5, I don't know the answer to that. And I welcome input from anybody uh, who may have some thoughts on that. Um, it's an open issue in my opinion. Uh, so so now, now we go to general workplace protections. Um, at, as we discuss this today, many of our clients are working, some are receiving PPP money so that they have staff on payroll for eight weeks, as opposed to having to furlough everyone. For those able to maintain some semblance of, of current operations, the majority are working from remote locations for compliance with the stay at home orders. Companies are coordinating their staffs via Zoom, editing is done remotely, some equipment has been provided to staff at home where creative business prep planning and posts are being conducted. When it is necessary to actually get together during this period, it should be kept to a minimum and precautions should be taken. And we'll get into the particular precautions in a minute. Uh, since this may go on for a while, 
particularly here in California. I mean, one example is CAA has already advised its staff to stay remote until August 1st. Uh, it's my understanding, uh, and again, if you have different information, please you know, contribute uh, a little later, uh, that the Warner stages aren't gonna be open or, or available until September 1st, and that several of the other stages and studios are using that as a guide. Uh, with September 1st as a focus, we're looking at July and August to begin heavy prep where individuals will have to start interacting with each other uh, in closer proximity. Meanwhile, Prodco's are producing elsewhere, such as one of my clients is getting ready to shoot in Georgia. You know, uh, they're preparing to shoot again, uh, you know, as soon as possible, as soon as they can do it safely. I also received last night a link from the state of Connecticut where one of the shows I work on, a strip show, uh, has a process for submitting a self-certification protocol, you know, to advise that you have sufficient protocols for approval once they're ready to start opening up. Many of the precautions we'll discuss are basic common sense, but still require adherence and constant awareness of the environment and other personnel. There are basic general safety rules governed by OSHA and Cal OSHA. These have been in place, and although they're, again, as I said before, common sense, they're not always front and center in our minds. California requires all facilities, companies, and employers to maintain an injury and illness protection program, which requires certain actions be taken by employers and that all employees be informed of these procedures. As noted, this is a, a basic ongoing requirement, and uh, I think I'd collect a lot of nickels on a bet that the majority of small to mid-sized production companies don't comply uh, and are probably most likely unaware of this requirement. You know, and if we go to the slide uh, on OSHA, uh, you, you'll see a lot of the requirements that, that are, uh, are general requirements. And this slide also contains, you know, other issues in context of the COVID issue. Uh, there is a link at the bottom of this page to the uh, Injury and Illness Protection Plan Program uh, website, uh, you know, from the Labor Department in California, uh, where you can gather a lot of information as one, the purpose, the requirement, and a lot of the other uh, things that you need to follow. Uh, for that. Uh, I'm not going to go through all those points there. N now we're at a point in the process of where the teams are going to start up. Um, as I said earlier, you know, those who got PPPs, I've got one client, you know, got enough PPP to put 39 people back on, on staff. Uh, they're all working from home, but they're all working. And, uh, I have another client that got the PPP that they cannot operate at all. Uh, they're a live production and they're just paying their people uh, to keep them, uh, you know, above water. Uh, as I said, there's some good links in, in the materials. Uh, one is a link to a, a preliminary draft of the Lionsgate production guidelines. Uh, and another is the British Film Commission's preliminary guidelines. As I noted earlier, you know, all of these, they're all drafts at this point. They're moving targets. And, you know, they're, they're subject to further modification uh, as people start getting back online. And as I said earlier also, the goal would hopefully that all of everybody, everybody would get together and come up with one final protocol that uh, everyone could follow and, and comply with. Each comp, you know, uh, in the interim, each company should establish its own protocols. But I suspect by the time we, like I said, to get to the end, there would be one general protocol. As our teams start up, these protocols should be in place for early prep and office sharing. Rules should be established up front, set out in writing and discussed with all employees before they enter the workplace. They should all be aware of it. Social distancing should be maintained and an abundance of caution establishing policies to check temperatures upon arrival and sometimes even twice a day. When they're in prep and working in an office, as I said, they sh if they're gonna be interacting with everybody, they should be wearing masks. 
they should be disinfecting the phones and door handles on a regular basis. Uh, anyone not feeling well shouldn't come into work, or if they start not feeling well, should leave automatically at that point. You know, uh, as various departments commence work, it's suggested that you set up the pods. And I think if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the Lionsgate materials that the RAP put out, you know, exposed, uh, you'll see a, a good breakdown of the type of pods uh, to limit the interaction between different departments, you know, and keep it to a minimum uh, on how, how you can break it out. Uh, and those who don't need to be in direct contact with each other. Uh, the, the PowerPoint also has a, a page of maintaining a hygienic workplace. Um, and again, this is pretty much a breakdown of, uh, of what should be done. Uh, what I want to do now is briefly, it's not in the PowerPoint, but I want to go through a list of some of these uh, suggested, you know, protocols that should go. And I think uh, one from the British Film Commission is pretty good. Uh, so I'm just going to go through it, you know, kind of quickly point by point so you can get an idea of how the agencies are looking at having the production companies move forward and do these various protocols. Uh, all staff must take coronavirus safety training before they commence work. I mentioned that earlier. They should be advised, you know, how they should be behaving and what precautions they should take. With regard to when you get to set, every production should have a COVID-19 supervisor, uh, someone who is dedicated to just making sure that you're in compliance and address issues as they come up that could render uh, the workplace unsafe. Uh, there should be daily briefings of this practice if something, you know, comes up. Uh, posters hung on walls and online tools should be made available for current up-to-date information for the production. Uh, studios, it's recommended. And, and again, this is not just the British Film Commission. There's a lot of crossover with multiple protocols that are out there. But I thought this brought a lot of them together. There should be extra security at the sets. Uh, this should limit, you know, only people who need to be there in the workplace uh, entering, which means we lawyers who do like to go to set, you're not welcome. You shouldn't be welcome. Um, there should be testing and health checks. Cast and crew should undergo pre-shoot health screenings, have their temperature checked twice a day. Uh, and again, if someone displays any kind of symptoms, they should be sent home. Uh, or to their accommodation. Uh, social distancing, and one item that, you know, not everybody mentions is mental health in these situations. So, you know, as everyone should observe the six foot distancing to the extent feasible. Where it's not possible, the people should spend to get, together, should be limited, the time people spend together should be limited and should work shoulder to shoulder, back to back, not face to face if possible, and of course be, you know, have masks. People should avoid physical contact when greeting each other, no, not even fist bumps and elbow bumps, et cetera. Just sm you know, smile under your mask. Uh, producers should make extra provisions for mental health availability, offering support in, you know, in, in, in where there's increased anxiety and stress just from the situation itself. Uh, on transport, uh, you know, uh, you want to be as careful as possible as if you have to fly people somewhere. Uh, you know, domestic transport should be the last resort. Individuals being driven to and from sets. You know, the standard is, you know, as a lawyer representing production companies, you don't want exclusive unless you're a top A++ person. Uh, otherwise, we say we want them to be, uh, you know, shared with above the line. Not even that now. If someone gets uh, transportation, they should have one dedicated driver and one vehicle and should not be shared with anybody else. Um, the less contact with third parties, the better. Although, Larry, I understand there's been some talk about um, people that are getting ready to start shooting that they're going to have the entire cast, like first they all be quarantined, and then when they come there, 
they're all sequestered together with just the cast and the hair and makeup person that has to touch them. And when, and they travel together and they're on the set, they're separated from the rest of the crew. And then they go back to the hotel and they can co-mingle with each other because they're in their own bubble. Uh, that, that's something that's been done. So in that case, you could have a van right. perhaps that has all of those people that are clearly tested and safe. Yes, yeah, certainly. If you, if you have a, uh, a group that is within, you know, uh, a single space going from studio to hotel, the hotel is sequestered in a point where you're only interacting with the people. I think Tyler Perry's production company is going to put people up in a, in a separate location. Uh, or by the studio, and I think in foreign countries they, they, they've done that or they're looking at that where they have been able to start up. Uh, it's certainly a consideration. And, and you can do the same thing with the departments, the whole camera department, you know, travel together in one van right. and stay together in their bubble right. and the art department in their bubble, things like that. Sure, and, and that's in the case where, you know, you're able to do that, and if you're on location, you know, so many of the productions are local. If you're in the studio zone and everyone's staying at home and going elsewhere, and it's certainly, and I'll get into it a little later, an economic impact, all of this. Um, next is, uh, you know, quarant and, and actually, that's almost the next area I'm getting into, David. Uh, the cast and crew from outside the U.S. should be quarantined and tested and kept together. Uh, communications with those in quarantine, sh you know, uh, should be done, you know, remotely while they're, while they're in quarantine. Uh, cast and crew on set, as I said before, no visitors. Uh, cast and crew should be organized into numerous cohorts and pods, which I mentioned before. Shoots should build in extra prep time to allow departments to work alone, such as set dressing and lighting, so you don't have everybody on set at the same time. Uh, shared equipment should be sanitized between you know people using it. Uh, access to shared working space, as I noted earlier, should be limited. Uh, and you should be using, you know, walkies and remote communications as much as possible. Catering, uh, there should be no communal food. I think food. I think we're following that, you know, in our own situations as we go in stores today. Uh, Single-use foods, eating utensils should be encouraged. Meal times, you know, should be staggered to the extent possible by different departments. Uh, staff should be dedicated to all cleaning work air, to cleaning all their own work areas, communal spaces such as toilets, dressing rooms should be deep cleaned daily. Waste should be disposed of safely. Sets should be locked down when not in use. Uh, personnel, and hired personnel and hired equipment should be shared, should not be shared. And where it's unavoidable, it should be regularly disinfected. And we get into actual shooting with crowd scenes. Uh, I've seen a number of these protocols where they say create them with CGI. That, you know, that would be the preferred me method. Uh, to reduce the number of supporting cast on set. Ex when you do need extras, you should keep them socially distanced, should not be facing each other, should be on set for as little time as possible, and when not required to be close to each other, of course, have the social distancing. Uh, and all the extras you know, should be doing their own hair and makeup. Uh, no sharing. Art department crew, and there's a really good link to an art department uh, uh, let me see where it is. A commercial art department workflow considerations on COVID-19 uh, that there's a link for in the, in the materials. Uh, it'd be really good for, uh, to take a look at that. Uh, you know, the sanitized props, furniture, and set dressings. Uh, handling a key prop should be limited to only the relevant actors. Props and decorations should be purchased online where possible so you're not going out to various places. Uh, you're not touching things. Costumes, fitting should take place offset or remotely where possible. Physical contact should be kept at a minimum and those involved should use PPP. Costumes should be hung in plastic wrappings when not in use and avoid. Hair and makeup, you know, keep the station six feet apart. Ban food and drink while people are getting done. PPP should be used at the setup stations by the makeup artists, the hair people, and the talent. Tools should be allocated to cast members and, sing and single-use applicators and single-use makeup designated for the individual. 
You know, there should be no cross-contamination on any of this stuff. Uh, everything should be sealed when done. Uh, best to throw it out at the end of the day and start anew the next day. Uh, locations, you know, you want to have a big enough location where you can do the social distancing. Uh, it, you know, a lot of suggestions are that you do as many location uh, scouting through VR to the extent possible. Uh, and they should all be deep cleaned. Dress sets, you know, once a set is dressed, it should be really quarantined for 72 hours before a shoot. Um, Film Florida also has published guidelines, some of which address items not noted in the British Film Commission notes that I sent above, uh, that are also representative of good practice. There is a link in the material to an article on this, and I thought I'd go through some of these additional items quickly. Uh, eliminate director chairs for plastic chairs as they're easier to disinfect. I wouldn't have thought of that. But, you know, the fabric in a director's chair collects. Uh, so make it plastic. You can clean that off a lot easier. You know, have the director limit takes uh, to make sets more efficient, less standing around time. Uh, consider barriers while establishing marks and positions. Y utilize, consider expanding your, your, you know, your support area with bigger tents, portable AC or heat in lieu of trailers or motorhomes. Uh, eliminate open calls, give assigned minutes, you know, time periods. Uh, during in-person auditions, actors can wear face shields, gloves, maintain social distancing. A, lo a lot of this is re repetitive, but it's important. Use gloves and masks when looking through garments in rental houses and retail stores and if you're going out for props. Of course, disinfect jewelry and glasses be uh, gl between use. Face shields should be worn by the makeup artist or hairstylist, which is a good idea, you know, to have that. You know, label mics also for the user when you have a you know prefer but to the extent you can use a boom use a boom have uh, one individual put up and take down all the location signs uh, once the hard copies of scripts are done one person should distribute one person should collect and destroy uh, for intimate scenes you got to have everybody tested and make sure you go through the 14 days before uh, and after uh, a new twist was raised yesterday, and you know I got a notice uh, with SAG-AFTRA advising its members that they should not accept any new work or return to work under existing contracts without its approval. This implies that SAG-AFTRA will have to review the production's protocols, giving it the power of control. That's how I'm reading it, to determine if it's safe for its members to go on set. So I'm hopeful that we can get one master protocol for everybody. Beyond, beyond these production, I'm going to try and wrap up quickly now. Beyond these production specific items, productions for television that require audiences are going to have to be creative. We're talking about game shows, court shows, and participatory talk shows, generally among others. So we're, we're looking at how the productions as well as, you know, the networks for the TV programs are going to work around that. For those of you online, in, you know, in the session here who work for networks, who work for networks and studios that are the financiers of most projects, counsel who represent production companies, you know, uh, like me, and, and I can't speak for everyone, but for myself, I'm asking that you, network representatives, recognize that going forward under these new protocols, it's going to cost money. And that the recognize that it's not something the production companies can absorb on its own. You know, the production fee is way too low to begin with. So we're asking that you recognize that there be a line item in each budget dedicated to the COVID-19 protocol compliance. Uh, and that, you know, going forward from this point should be something we have, uh, you know, in consideration. I'm sure many of you have additional protocol recommendations and I certainly welcome them. That's it. Greg? Well, thanks, thanks, uh, Larry. You know, we've got a whole slew of questions as you might uh, anticipate, but I know as, you know, as an accountant at heart, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, everything that you kept saying was, uh, you know, do this separately, do that separately, separate person, separate for that person. We all knew at the end of the day, and, 
you know, again, my financial mind kicks in and I'm just seeing, you know, the, the, the dollar sign, like at the old fashioned gas pumps, right? It's just kind of rolling, 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 which means you're, you're talking about little things, uh, but cumulatively they're, they're going to really have an impact on the bottom line of a lot of, a lot of productions. Uh, and if, if we're talking about even potentially self-insuring for, for, for some of this stuff because of all the exclusions or, you know, increased, as Winnie mentioned, increased uh, deductibles, uh, lower limits, so on and so forth, who's going to be able to put on a movie? Well, I mean, that's, that's the big question, I, you know, uh, you know, and Peter, I don't, I don't know if he's still on, you know, on the financing side on, on, on film, and I, I honestly don't do a lot of film, I do mostly television, uh, is that you're going to have to provide for it in your budgets, as I mentioned in the end. I, I mean, we're, we're going to need, the production companies are going to need the support of the financiers uh, to prepare for that additional cost. And what, what, you know, and, and then you've also got this, these, a few of the other things that you brought up, waivers, right? If, if people are doing waivers, I mean, look, if you go to, you know, the LA County Fair and you sign a waiver before you get on the Ferris wheel, we all, those waivers are dubious in their enforceability. What about these waivers? How enforceable are they going to be? Well, I, you know, it's interesting because I know, you know, for example, one of the networks tells me that uh, I have to have my crew sign a waiver for all risk. And that's not, doesn't work in California. You know, I've argued them over and over and I have to have put a provision in there that says, you know, subject to local law um, because that's why you have workers comp. And at least during this period of time until July 5th, employees will be covered by workers comp. Now, with regard to uh, loan outs, where production companies are still hiring loan outs, I've tried to expand, you know, against council advice with, with regard to AB5. There are clients that still hire people through loan outs. And I've expanded my, you know, one page inducement to a guarantee and waiver of about three pages. Uh, from the owner of the of the loan out to uh, try and protect the production company uh, to the extent uh, as much as possible, but who knows if it gets to court what 's going to happen and well, even when you have a loan out situation there 's usually in that inducement letter it states that for the purposes of workers comp you we are your special employer uh, your loan out is your primary employer and but uh, either one of us could, could take on the workers' comp obligation. Generally, the special employer, the production company, takes on the workers' comp obligation, and it's a prudent thing to do uh, because you limit, I'd rather have my client's liability limited to the actuary tables established by the workers' comp system uh, than to sue in, in civil court and have a jury and have punitive damages. That's the beauty of the workers' comp exclusivity bargain. Um, you give up, uh, you, 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 it's strict liability, but you don't have the threat of punitive damages and, and the unknown of, of what liability is, and you, you're covered by insurance. Right. Dave, David, and I don't disagree with you, but I think it's an open issue now with the impact of AB5. And I think it's an unknown question. And you know, part of our, the inducement says that, that you, you have a business license, you have, you know, you have all those factors, and you have workers' comp, which we know that 99% of those loan outs don't carry their own workers' comp. Um, yeah, we can, that's a long discussion because obviously <laughs> being in, in business management, we, we deal mostly with uh, loan outs. And uh, but I'm I'm not going to get into that. That's a rabbit hole we'll stay away from. But uh, and and I want to get back on track because we're running short on time here, and I want to give David some time. But one last question: uh, You mentioned COVID supervisors. Uh, are those people going to need to have special training? Can I be a COVID supervisor? I I you know I, there's nothing in, in in writing at this point. All they're saying is that someone should be a COVID supervisor. And I think that you have to treat them like a safety person that has to be trained just like a medic, you know, in all the uh, best practices to avoid problems on set. And I think the insurance companies will come in at a later point and say, yes, this person needs, you got to 
take these precautions. And, and of course, the first AD on the set is in charge primarily of overseeing safety. So uh, this should be someone that reports directly to the first AD. The first AD should also be extremely involved in uh, COVID, understanding COVID-19. And when you put out the daily call sheets, generally there will be the unique uh, safety uh, issues of the day. We're shooting in, in the desert. It's going to be 110 degrees. Make sure you stay hydrated. Here's where the nearest hospital is. There's going to need to be, you know, little breakdown reminders about um, COVID-19, uh, you know, on every call sheet. And uh, as Larry mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's highly recommended. It's always been recommended that you have a 10 minute safety talk at the start of every day that for, to point and, and, and to point out those unique hazards that exist today and just keep people remind, you know, safety in the mind of everybody. Um, part of those 10 minute tool talks, safety talks should be constant reminders about COVID-19 and an introduction of the, uh, the, the, the supervisor. And as I always say, um, you know, safety is everybody's business. Don't just walk over a loose cord, you know, tell a grip, tell somebody that that needs to be taped down. The same thing if they, I think when you're going to need everyone to give reminders that if they see some type of COVID violation that we, we tell everybody, speak up. All right. Uh, we're running a little short on time here. We're down to about 12 minutes left. So, uh, David, um, I, I definitely have to drop out of here too. So I'm sure other people do as well. Uh, so David, have at it. Okay, great. And the beauty of being on a webinar is if, uh, you know, you want, you want to stay longer, uh, we, we, we can stay a bit longer. The Beverly Hills Bar said they're not going to be turning anything off right, right away. Um, and I can kind of monitor some of the questions if we haven't gotten to all of those answers. Uh, so I want to talk about um, a, uh, force majeure and the, um, the common law doctrines of frustration of purpose, uh, impracticability, and warranty to comply with, uh, with, with, with the laws. Um, and that's, you know, stuff that, that appears in a lot of boilerplate in contracts and people often don't give um, a lot of time to them. Uh, first, I, I keep getting the same question. Uh, is this a force majeure? What effects are it of the force majeure? And what people have to understand is force majeure is a creature of contract. Um, the contract provisions themselves govern what is a force majeure. And I know a lot of people will say they, they leave it without being defined. And they're saying, well, follow whatever is industry standard in practice as, as how that term is defined. Well, even within the industry, you're going to see different definitions of force majeures from uh, you know, studio contracts than you're going to see in the union contracts. Um, so, uh, force majeure is, is really taking the doctrines of frustration of purpose and impracticability and bringing them into your contract and saying this is what the parties have agreed uh, uh, will, uh, will, will happen when these things are deemed impracticable. Uh, so um, step one, understand Force majeure is a creature of contract. There's really no such thing as the industry standard. It's what your contract says it is. You can borrow from studio language. You can borrow from union language. Uh, you can create your own. But uh, every transactional attorney should, you know, just not, you know, just point and click and accept force majeure. If you're a talent attorney, just don't accept it. You know read it and, um, and, and see, you know, how does this need to be changed for my client's particular, uh, particular needs and what side is your client on? Um, and for some producers, when they're dealing with their, their talent and people that they owe an obligation to, um, where, uh, that, that obligation, they, they, they may um, 
they're going to want to say, yes, this is force majeure and I can get out of my obligation. In other times, a producer um, is the one that owes, uh, that, that uh, uh, is, is seeking the obligation from another. And in which case, you know, you do not want that obligation to, uh, to, uh, to, to disappear. Um, so you may want to specifically say, in the event of a government order, unless that government order specifically directly affects our ability to make the purpose of this contract occur, directly prevents you from providing what services you need to provide to us, that is not going to be deemed a force majeure that allows us to get out of the contract. It's like what uh, Peter said earlier, um, you know, with a sales agent. Well, if you're in Spain, maybe COVID-19 is legitimately a force majeure. It affects your ability to perform the obligations under the contract. But you know, a, a, another foreign sales agent, and if you're just dealing with Netflix, what, what, what are you talking about? Your, your single obligation is to pay me. This isn't a force majeure. Um, you're paying others. So uh, be aware of that. Now, SAG does not, it, it, it d discusses, they use the term acts of God. And uh, I have seen uh, in, in a situation with um, uh, Actors' Equity where the, um, the union was refusing to allow producers to get to uh, uh, recognize a force majeure by these, these government orders and the COVID-19 because they're saying your failure to put on the play does not meet our definition of force majeure. But the term act of God does exist. And this is a big argument involving big bucks. And I think it's a no-brainer because this virus is a, is a living entity. You know, who, who creates living creatures but God? Now, you want to get into a religious uh, discussion of evolution and Darwinism versus creativity, uh, creationism. It doesn't matter. I think the euphemism act of God covers evolutionary events. You want to call it an act of mother nature. You know, you don't want to charge it with, with God. It is a euphemism, which clearly means natural events and natural occurrences. So I have a real fundamental problem with the unions when they're trying to claim, uh, you know, the pandemic does not fall into an act of God uh, definition. Uh, but these are the type of things that are in the trenches that people are going to be fighting over and that currently are fighting over. Now, moving forward, everyone's going to be a little bit smarter. And if you're a transactional attorney, you should be thinking about these things. You know, parcel out the... Uh, the, you're, you're the clause for force majeure and how you're seeking to define it. Um, and take a good, careful look at the language of, say, the union contracts and, and things like, and the distributors' contracts. And, and um, if they need to be modified, I think, you know, I, I can't imagine we're going to get the standard, sorry, that's unchangeable, we don't change it. Um, and if you do get that, then you know, you go in with your eyes open and you t explain that to your client. Um, it, you know, uh, sure, courts can come in and, and uh, apply all of the, uh, the, the common rules for interpretation, um, such as uh, interpret ambiguities against the drafter uh, and, and, and things like that. Um, I don't think anyone really wants to have courts decide these disputes. And I know there are a lot of these disputes, but I think everyone needs to give a little and achieve some type of rational settlement and, and really think about how these clauses affect 
the the one party, particularly the party that has to reach in his pocket and and uh, pay out money. Um, because if it does go to the courts, I think not only are they going to apply the traditional rules of interpretation, such as ambiguities get get uh, uh, applied against the drafter, uh, but I mean, the courts aren't viewing these things in a bubble. And what they decide in the first cases to come forward, just like the, the French laundry case trying to determine uh, the, uh, the language of an insurance clause, it's not just one case, two parties. Uh, these decisions are going to have precedent. And judges understand that their decisions are going to have real effect on public policy and their decisions could bankrupt an entire industry, you know, if they say, no, you must pay in this situation, or no, there is no obligation to pay. So trying to predict how courts are going to decide these ambiguities, um, this is an unprecedented event, and they need to make the precedent, and they will be. Uh, looking at, at, at things uh, from a much broader angle of how are these decisions going to affect um, the, the broader society and, and our economy. So whether they're, the, so what if you, you come to the conclusion the force majeure language does not exist in your contract, you can't rely on that. Um, you have common law principles that have always existed. Um, you have the doctrine of frustration of purpose. And it's real interesting, that doctrine was created way back when, before, uh, you know, in, in, um, in England, before we were even a country, uh, the common law that we brought over uh, to this country from England, uh, dated back to um, a coronation, and I, I, I wish I knew exactly which king was, was being coronated at the time, but uh, a group of people paid a lot of money for the best possible hotel room that had a balcony with a view of, uh, of the coronation event. And the king took sick, the coronation was canceled, and everybody understood that the reason these people were paying a premium for this hotel room was for the coronation and that the entire that was the that was the primary and only purpose for why this hotel room was being rented out and the courts established the the, the doctrine of frustration of purpose and said both parties go back to their original position as before as as they were before they ever contracted which means the parties get their deposit back um, you can see this is happening with the Olympics. You can see that this happening with a lot of people that had contracts at South by Southwest, be it hotel rooms or um, restaurants that they were going to rent out. The first doctrine of frustration of purpose doesn't matter um, whether uh, you had a, a force majeure clause or not. That is, that's good old plain old common law that that can be a remedy for your your client, um, and uh, along with it is the the common law doctrine of impossibility, which is known today as the doctrine of impracticability. Um, little, slight, you know, not completely impossible, but for all basic intensive purposes, it's incredibly impracticable. Um, and that that too can be argued. You know, we can't move forward uh, because of this COVID nineteen thing. We're going to have um, even before the government shutdown, uh, I was representing a production company putting together a very small short film uh, that was going to be like a public service announcement for anti-child abuse. And all of their money came from a 501c3 charity. And even before the shutdown, they saw the writing on the wall and were t telling their uh, locations, the, the, the set that they wanted to, to rent, we can't be here. Even if the law allows us to appear, we have a higher level to answer to because we're a 501c3 charity. We cannot subject our crew to COVID-19 in these situations. Um, and I realize we're at two o'clock, though hopefully many people will stick around 
and uh, the uh, those that do need to leave. I understand the Beverly Hills Bar uh, will um, be circulating this PowerPoint, and uh, I'm. You can also throw some questions in my direction. Uh, my contact information's in the bio. Um, so uh, these are common law th uh, arguments. Again, it's it, it, they're not going to be decided in a bubble. It's not just two parties. One of the things that I've used uh, really well, I used this in the, in the case of the charity, was, look, I don't care how you treat everybody else. I just care about my client. Give them their gal darn deposit back today and relieve them from this obligation. And, if, you know, and we can have a confidentiality agreement about it. But if you don't do this and you force me to go to court, I'm not bringing, you know, a limited jurisdiction claim to recover, you know, the 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 minor amounts that my client paid for you um, for their short film. I'm going to make this a class action and and seek reimbursement for everybody that's dealing with you because they're all in the same situation. Um, and again, bear in mind that when the judges make these decisions, they're going to realize the, the, the effect it's going to have on the entire economy. Another good excuse that you can use in contracts to get out if you can't use the, the, the contractual definition of force majeure, darn it, we, 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 should have, we should have drafted that tighter, we should have made that apply, um, we didn't. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you can't use the frustration of purpose, or you can't use the doctrine of impracticability, you can also use the compliance of government law rendering a contract void. Um, and you can throw all three up against the wall and, and hope that one of them uh, works. Uh, every, most contracts have an express clause in there that says, you represent and warrant that you will comply with all government laws, regulations, statutes, et cetera. You know, when you're using our sets, you're going to comply with this. Well, you can use the drafter's own language against them and say, by law, we can't step foot in there. By law, we are subject to this government order. And therefore, you know, we have to recognize that that is an excuse to contract performance, and both parties go back to their original position as if the contract uh, never even existed. Um, Again, you can see that depending on what side of the equation you're on, uh, you can render different arguments. These are the weapons that are in your toolbox, your arsenal uh, as uh, transactional attorneys, as uh, litigation attorneys, and you should uh, brush up on your uh, you know, 1L contracts class about these common law doctrines and how they can affect today. Now, Moving forward, we would expect to see transactional attorneys to have these, exp these express uh, points in mind and um, to uh, account for them in, in the draft. Um, and there you have uh, the doctrine of frustration of purpose I talked about, uh, impracticability. It's the most important thing about impracticability is it needs to be something that was not foreseen by either party. Again, moving far forward, people are going to say, well, everyone foresaw the possibility of a pandemic. This is more applies to the contracts of, uh, that, that, that were in effect before March. That's why impracticability may not exist in future contracts but compliance with government mandates will will yes we foresaw that this could happen but the government put down another lockdown order and it, it, you're the only way we show up on your set or our my actor does you know what you're demanding i see someone says how can you uh how do you deal with an actor that doesn't want to show up on the set if they can say you're not in compliance with the government mandates that's a pure excuse to contract defense. And if the government mandate says it's okay, well, then you can hold the actor responsible. But unless SAG says, no, it doesn't meet our standards. 
And if you are signatory to the union, you are not only have to comply with all federal, state, and local laws, but you have to apply to the rules that the union uh, prescribes. And that's part of your obligation as a signatory company. If the union says it's okay for the actor to work and the actor's still not working, you know, then you're getting into uh, where we really earn our keep as, as lawyers and, and try to uh, uh, wrestle with, with those answers. Um, so uh, feel free to look at these PowerPoint materials. Um, remember, courts will interpret in the context of unprecedented events on how it affects public policy. Uh, you're not just pleading your, spe your, your specific facts, but it's an entire industry, and it might behoove you to argue to the judge, or as I did argue to uh, the location that was renting my client. Look, we don't have to make this you know, the entire industry. We can carve this out very, very small, so it's just a single exception. Um, just some real quick other legal issues to talk about. Uh, we, we talked about the KL OSHA and federal uh, general work standings. Something that everyone should be aware of is the Federal and California Warn Act. Under the, the, the this is a law that says, um, if you have uh, more than a, uh, a, a requisite number of, of, of employees and you engage in a mass layoff or shutdown, you have to give 60 days advance notice uh, of that to the employer uh, and to certain government, uh, to the employees uh, and to certain government uh, entities. And if you fail to give that 60 days advance notice, every employee gets one day's pay for each day that 60 days was lacking in the giving of that, that notification. And there can be some other penalties imposed by the government. Um, the federal government has a complete exception that applies here. They have a, um, an exception for unforeseen business necessity. The state of California has its own state equivalent of the Warren Act, the Cal Warren Act, but it does not have a pure exception for unforeseen business necessity. Uh, I wrote, I requested an opinion letter from the Labor Commissioner to have them recognize that the exception that does exist in California, which is the an exception for failure to give notice in the event of a physical calamity uh, that, that, that this pandemic qualifies as a physical calamity and clearly they couldn't give 60 days advance notice. So there should be an exception similar to the exception that exists for uh, under the federal law. Um, my letter was brought to the governor's attention and rather than let the labor commissioner give an opinion on the physical calamity exception, which has never been defined, and uh, there is absolutely no uh, statutory authority or precedent of any kind regarding what that, that term means. Uh, and again, I would say, you know, the calamity is this this virus is physical. It is a living entity that is. It threatens to come into your location and be all on about, and that is why you need to shut the place down, just as if flood water came into your establishment. They chose to leave it open for anyone to argue that this is a physical calamity, but they created a safe harbor that said, um, as long as you give new notice of your need for a mass shutdown, uh, as soon as practicable, as soon as you recognized you need it, the 60-day the rule will not apply. You won't owe one day's pay for each day that you were less than 60 days. Um, but you also still need to notify the three different government entities that you need to notify. One of them is the unemployment office, one of them is the uh, regional um, 
uh, workers uh, development uh, associations that different counties uh, have, uh, and they all have different addresses and different places, and some counties have multiple locations, uh, and there's the labor commissioner themselves. Uh, you don't, you still have to notify those three government agencies. So the government, according to the government's order, in order to meet the safe harbor, you have to tell three different government agencies, we are shut down and we have laid off our employees because the government has shut us down and we were forced to lay off employees. Uh, it seems like the, the last thing the state of California needs is more bureaucracy and more paperwork. Uh, certainly the unemployment office doesn't need to process any more paperwork. But this is the way um, the executive order was, uh, was written. I think it is, remains a trap for the unweary. Um, many, many companies that, that, that are affected, that are having these mass layoffs, um, are not up on this obscure law, do not know that they still have the obligation to notify uh, three different government agencies. and. I think two of them can be reached by email, but one of them you still have to send an old-fashioned letter to. Uh, if that happens, and if some smart aleck plaintiff's uh, class action attorney says, I'm going to file a claim and get 60 days pay for all, you know, multiplied by the number of employees, um, there, is the, there is still in court, you can argue that the, the, the calamity exception that rendered 60 days notice impossible. Um, and I know I have a number, I have a couple of clients that have been continued to pay their employees during this time. But in the next, starting like next week, they're going to have to do the layoff. So this is still timely. This isn't just, hey Dave, we should have known this 60 days ago, uh, back in March. Uh, for, for many people, you know, they're just taking a wait and see and they really thought that the, um, the time was going to change in May. All right, so that's it. I, I, I see we're coming to 2.15. L.A. Superior Court is closed until June 22nd, but the clerk's office reopens June 15. There's the, exec, the, uh, the, uh, the order that was uh, put forth by the, uh, the courts there. And um, you will be getting certification from this from the Beverly Hills Bar for your MCLE credit. Uh, there's going to be a little pop-up evaluation. Please let us know how you liked it. Um, thanks for watching. I'm David at PierceLLP.com. Uh, if there's any follow-up questions, um, what is the effect of California and other states' Act of God statutes on the definition of force majeure? Um, does, is there an actual uh, definition, Ken, uh, that says this is what Act of God is? Or are you just saying where it applies in other certain other uh, other uh, areas, uh, I think that's probably what it is. I don't think there's a universal definition that says in all circumstances, this is how California defines an act of God. Um, if there is, uh, I need to, uh, to go back and, and take a look at that. Um, but it probably is just saying, well, this is how it applies in bankruptcy, or this is how it applies in, in these situations. It's all authority. Uh, everything, um, is, it's, it's not a precedent, it's an authority, it's something to argue, it's something to put in your litigation arsenal. Um, and uh, the force majeure clause does not preclude the common law theories. Um, at least, uh, I have not seen a precedent that specifically says that. I think a contract clause could be drafted to specifically say that, and you could contract around that if there is a meeting of the minds between both parties and they fully understood it. If not, you know, the ambiguity is going to go against the drafter or uh, maybe a court buys into that because of the overall public policy and they don't want to hurt the economy. Um, I, 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 we're, we're now at 2.15. Uh, I, um, I, on behalf of uh, all the other speakers, I, I want to uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will continue to put on similar webinars, and we invite and encourage you to be on the list. And if you have ideas for webinars, 
Join us every Wednesday, the fir first Wednesday of every month via Zoom. Uh, reach out to um, uh, at the Beverly Hills Bar. Tell them you want to be involved, and we're happy to, uh, uh, to have you involved. Please be safe. Uh, David, David, yes, I go ahead, Larry. I want to mention one thing that while you were speaking, uh, Deadline Hollywood came up with uh, an article on insurance. I uh, haven't had a chance to fully read it, uh, but it looks like it's very interesting, and I would commend everyone to to take a read. And you can see, I've got, I'm ready, I'm prepared to be fully in business, and I've got my uh, my, my fun little thermometer gun. And uh, oh, I got to get my mask. Anybody, anybody that wants to come visit me, uh, you know, we'll we'll have masks, we'll have gloves, and I'll and I'll you know pretend I'm zapping you with a ray when I'm really taking your th your temperature. And uh, my temperature is ninety seven point <laughs> seven. So uh, I'm good good to go. Come see me. Come play. And uh, be, be safe. safe. Be safe. Remember to wash your hands. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> Take care, everybody.